So we have two slides today. I had three. We have one that says, you're in the right room. And then we have one that says, tweet about it. And if you want to get in touch with us. Um, we'll wait for Paul to get his. No, no, Paul. We'll, we'll all stare at you awkwardly. Can I eat my bagel while we're doing this? Yes. You may, you may eat, your, eat your bagel as long as nobody out here has like a... a, a I'm going to turn your mic off so I can't hear you too. There you go. That's probably not a bad idea. <laughs> cool. So I uh, want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I'm really personally very excited about this because um, well, I'll give you a little bit of the background. Um, so this is, you know, we called it Pack Your Own Shoot, which, uh, you know, if you ever go skydiving, it's kind of a rite of passage to the point where you're confident enough about what you're doing and, and have, have kind of learned enough about the art to pack your own shoot and, and manage your own risk, um, which uh, is, is, I really think, a good um, analogy for what we're talking about today. Um, the way that this came about was I get asked a lot, uh, my name is Neil Tovson, by the way. I'm co-founder of Approve. Uh, we help making buying stuff for your job a lot easier. Uh, it's my second startup, and the first one was a complete and utter failure, but it was uh, an amazing personal journey to the point where I wanted to do it again. And, and I get asked a lot about how do, um, how do I find a co-founder, how do I find a technology person, how do I find a, a developer who's willing to work with startups, um, those sorts of things all the time. And it really, you know, I, I usually don't have a very good answer because we, there just aren't that many people who are willing to take a risk on it. And then we were talking with uh, one of Approve's seed investor, which is Ryan Brocher from Confluence Capital, and he's got another session I actually don't know what time slot it's in. Anyway, um, but he's like, you know, there's a ton of talent. And he, he stated the absolute obvious point, that there's a ton of talent in this town. Uh, there just isn't a culture that uh, really supports and, and, and helps educate people about what it's like to join a startup. And so all of a sudden, I started rewinding my own head to five years ago when I finally decided to start my own thing. and. All of a sudden, all of those fears came back into my mind about what that was like, having no idea what it was like. I, had, it, it, I didn't even know Minibar existed. It did, but I didn't know it existed. I certainly didn't have any friends in the space. Still don't um, have I still don't have friends, <laughs> but I know some people. And, uh, and so this sort of turned into what, what kind of a session do I wish I had gone to 10 years ago? Because as I kind of got into working with a startup, I found myself asking, you know, why, had, why didn't I do this 10 years ago? My career could have been completely different. Um, and so I'm really, really excited. And then, and then I was talking with some of these guys about it. And Todd, in particular, said, well, why don't we make a panel out of it? And I was like, oh, that's really cool. And so then I was like, well, let's talk about some different perspectives. So... Um, what I basically did was harassed my friends into, or, or maybe not my friends, but people I knew, into uh, uh, coming down here and sharing their experience with people so that hopefully we can at least demystify the whole thing a little bit and give you a little bit of an insight into what it's like and how people deal with the very real risks and fears about joining a startup or starting your own. Um, and so we've got Matt Hardy, uh, who is co-founder of KidBlog. Uh, and KidBlog is now how many? 4.7 million kids online. That's all right. Uh, and 350,000 teachers. And uh, I, I always joke with them because there's only, what, five people on the team? Four people on the team now? Five. Five. Five plus people on the team, so each person on KidBlog is supporting yeah, about a million users. That's a pretty good ratio. Uh, and then we have Liz Tupper, who founded Seant, uh, which was the first and only women gaming startup in Minneapolis, and uh, uh, ultimately not successful, but um, uh, uh, I think uh, we'll hear some interesting stuff there about where she's at now. She's now at Smart Things, uh, so she's joined news. another. Oh yeah, is that is is that news? Yeah, that is. That's breaking news. Yeah. So right. tell tell us about your new job. Start go. Yeah, no, I'm the mobile product manager now at Smart Things, um, and my, my startup experience is one of the things that really helped 
get me the job. So there's there's benefits to startups not working in in your ideal favor necessarily what you what you expected, but it, it can turn into a very lucrative future career opportunity if it doesn't work out the way you thought it was going to. And then we've got Paul DeBettings. I don't know if I ever pronounce his name right. That actually was right. Is that right? <laughs> cool. Yes. So Paul is, uh, if you weren't here for the previous session, uh, Paul is a tech recruiter. Um, as far as I'm concerned, he's the coolest in town because he works with startups. Um, uh, if you want to say a little bit about that. I just think it's, look, it's just because when you work with cool startups like Aaron and mobile realty apps that you can say that you're a cool recruiter in the startup space, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not like I'm any cooler than anybody else. It's just that if you can pick the right people to work with, um, then I look really good. So look, Aaron, keep going. <laughs> no pressure. But I, I thought it was really important to get Paul on this panel because he sees people, he sees people like Aaron who are trying to find talent and trying to figure out, you know, how to recruit. And then he also sees the flip side of people like us who are thinking about joining a startup and and kind of you know don't know what we don't know about it and so he sees both sides of that equation so. i did tell somebody the other day i think they need medication Me more medication <laughs> yes like, yeah, that, i that think i want to do this I'm like no you need to go to the doctor first <laughs> <laughs> this may not be for you and we've got todd gardner uh with track js and um i wanted todd on the panel because he's kind of going th he's living this right now I don't know if you want to say a little bit about that sure um so i'm one of three founders of track js um, we are still uh, still growing. None of us have quit our jobs yet, and we are doing this a, uh, a very slow, almost cowardly way of just working a whole lot. <laughs> Wait, how many of you in the room are doing that right now? Where you Anybody with side day? projects that they think are going to go somewhere someday? A couple of you? Awesome. How many of you don't want to raise your hand because you don't want anybody to know it? <laughs> the stealth startup. Awkward laughter. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I think it's really, really cool because not only are these great people, but they represent, each person on this panel has a very different perspective on this sort of question. Um, so I think, you know, let's start out, Matt, with you, if you don't mind. So tell us about how you kind of got KidBlog going and get us, give us the sort of origin story. Sure, yeah, the, um, the quick arc of the, the story is, um, my background is in, I got a computer science degree from University of Minnesota Morris. If there's any Morris people in the house, uh, there we go. Um, there is one. And I <laughs> uh, actually had a couple early attempts at entrepreneurship way too early. Uh, decided to shift gears and I actually went into elementary education. Taught in Eden Prairie, third, fourth, and fifth grade for about eight years. And Kidblog actually came out of my, essentially solving my own problem and my own world, which was, you know, managing a group of 30 students, you know, between 8 and 10 years old and trying to have them publish their work online in a safe environment. Um, and just setting them up with blogger accounts and sending them out into the wild west of the web was not, uh, not acceptable. So um, looked for a solution, uh, was amazed that there was nothing out there, and so kind of leveraged my tech background with my pedagogical uh, training, if you will, and, and merge this That's two. teacher tech speak. I'm just going to yeah, say, can you dumb that down for me, please? <laughs> uh, pedago yeah, pedagogy. I think it's the art of like people literally at your feet. So that's, that's a little bit demeaning to children. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, remember, that, see that red dot up there? Yeah, oh, this is, on, this is recorded. Okay. <laughs> and that's why you got out of being, teaching. <laughs> I'm going keep to keep track of how many times I say pedagogical today. Um, awesome. So KidBlog started as really just solving my own problem in my own universe, and it turned out that when I shared what I was doing with other teachers, um, they, I guess not surprisingly, had a similar problem, and so KidBlog um, kind of took off. Um, and so that went from just solving a, solving a problem that I had to sharing that solution with a bunch of people and then actually trying to turn that solution into a, a business so so how long did that take uh yeah i don't know if it's is like taking? you said the easy way out or the, well, the whatever be between starting and deciding to quit your day job uh between starting and quit my day job <laughs> again i don't know if this is maybe i'm supposed to be more like macho up here about how i just threw it all away or something but no it was like probably from conception to quit was like five years so 2007 is when I bought the domain name, kidblog.org, and uh, 
Were you sober when you came up with that idea? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Good. Um, and uh, yeah, 2012, um, technically took a leave of absence from my, from my job, which was actually kind of cool that the teacher's contract said, you could take a year with no pay, but you don't get fired, and you can try new things. And I was like, oh, I guess I'll do that. So um, that's why I think it, the title of this talk is, or this session is, is good. It's, it's pack your own shoot. It's not jump out of the plane without a shoot. Um, and so I leveraged as many shoots as, as I could along the way. Um, so That's definitely, b before we get too far here, um, I completely forgot. So uh, all of our information, uh, if you want to tweet it out, uh, we have, I kind of threw a hashtag up on top. We also have VoiceHive. So the VoiceHive guys, uh, uh, who are actually, one of them is sitting over there. Uh, but if you download the VoiceHive app, which is uh, Andy, um, uh, VoiceHive. Minidemo.voicehive.com. Mini demo or mini bar? Mini bar. Minibar.voicehive.com and pick the pack shoot one. And uh, I will supposedly, if I flip between my notes and my browser, actually see your questions right here. Whoa, really? Isn't that cool? Technology. So, Dang. Yeah. You're fancy. Isn't that cool? Uh, so uh, I have to go back to my notes. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. So one of the things that I think is really important to get across in this is, you know, that everybody finds a different way to mitigate the risk of a startup, whether you decide to quit your job and figure out a way to fund it, or whether you decide to keep your job. Liz, you, so what did the CN situation look like from that perspective? Because you had a co-founder as well, right? Yep. I had a co-founder. Um, we also had a team of people who are working for us for free as well. Um, but I continued to work my, my day job at the time. I was a, a single mom, and I really wanted to, I was very passionate about what I was doing. So all you people that say, I have a mortgage, and I have kids, and my wife stays at home, and all that other stuff, single mom can pull it off. You can find a way. Um, and so... I, I didn't necessarily have a financial cushion to fall back on, and not only, I, I wasn't necessarily worried about me eating, but I was worried about my child eating. Um, and so what I did is I worked 80 hours a week for 18 months, um, and where I made sacrifices was I never watched TV during that time. Uh, I never drank during that period of time. Um, I made sure to get enough sleep at night, and I could have cared less about housework. So, um, you know, I, I focused on the things that were important to me, but I also didn't neglect other things that were important to me. It was really important that I continued to maintain a relationship with my child. Um, and, you know, one of the things that really sort of drove me is I was working in corporate America for 13 years, and while I had gotten a lot of awesome things out of that, I knew it wasn't wasn't for me anymore, and so I was really sort of excited into diving into this new venture. And the great thing about having a child is they put this wonderful new perspective in your life. And I was like, what I want to show this child what it's like to be happy. Um, and for me, that was going out and doing things that would make make me happy. And so. That's what I did. Actually, it dovetails really well. We got a question on VoiceHive about how much, you know, how much of this was real, you know, how much of this had to do with the motivation factor of, of money. And so, you know, how, how much, you know, how did you resolve that sort of, you know, I, that, that desire to make more money versus the other things that make you happy? Yeah, for me, um, I'm not a person that tends to be motivated much by money. I need, you know, I, I live a certain lifestyle and I want to be able to continue to main that level. But I find that the more money I make, the more I spend and it just creates more complications. So for me, it's all about happiness and autonomy and freedom and the ability to do the things that I want to do. So. And it's, it's something that, you know, my startup didn't work out for me, but uh, as I continued on in my career, those are the things that still sort of hold true for me. Am I doing something that excites me? Um, am I contributing and applying my strengths the way that I want to? Um, and then are these other things like the freedom and autonomy there for me? And uh, another question just before we move over to Todd. Um, 
Uh, question off of voice hive, why didn't the startup work out? And at what point did you know? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So uh, we did a video game startup. We were creating episodic RPG style video games for PC, console, and mobile. Um, and uh, we were self-funded. Uh, and uh, 18 months in, uh, we had we had a beta, but no one is going to necessarily fund a video game company in Minnesota. It's just it's just the reality of the situation, um, and I wasn't willing to to move away here for for various reasons, um, and we weren't going to get funded. And so, after working 80 hours for 18 months, I decided to just sort of regroup and saw the writing on the wall. I think. Um, we were, we were getting a lot of tension in the game industry, both nationally and internationally. We should have done a Kickstarter. I think that would have really helped us, and at the time, it was would have worked. That was right around the time Kickstarter was there, right? Yep, yep, Kickstarter was new. Um, that would have sort of probably pushed us over the edge, but that's hindsight. So, um, but that, that's really for us. It was, we didn't have enough money to fund it ourselves and we needed to raise a lot of funds and it just wasn't gonna happen where we, where we are. All right, so Todd, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, tell us a little bit about what TrackJS is, how, you, how you're kind of getting it rolling, but, but what's, you know, what's going through your mind right now and what is the criteria of, and, and what are you using for criteria of knowing when it's able to sort of fly on its own out of the nest. <clears throat> and I've got a follow up. Okay. Uh, so what TrackJS is, is a service for other developers. All you can submit questions via voice hive. <laughs> <laughs> it's a service for other developers and we track JavaScript errors on web applications. So um, some of you maybe have used us. Uh, we've grown quite substantially in the last month. Um, and, and we give you a bunch of, of insight onto you know, what's going wrong when a customer is interacting with your app and how to fix it. Uh, it kind of grew out of our own need uh, from my co-founders where we were building these sort of application or large JavaScript applications for big enterprise clients. And uh, every time we'd build one of these things, we could solve their problems really fast and look like superheroes. So we wanted to build something like this that was even better than what we would build in our consulting and give it to everybody and make all the developers feel like superheroes. Um, we're growing fast, um, but we're growing in terms of users fast right now, not necessarily in terms of revenue. So uh, money is going to be the criteria of when we can walk out on our own. Um, we've been as successful as we have to date because we have very lucrative enterprise consulting um, relationships. And so that kind of sets a high bar for financial um, success to be able to walk away. Because we've is, all... is the goal that you have to match what you're doing right now? No, but we don't want to ask um, our families to make sacrifices when we walk away. Um, because it's not that we dislike our jobs. We love our jobs. We just like TrackJS more. Um, but we can keep, like, we like what we're doing right now. And I think we could continue doing it for the foreseeable future. Um, and if we can make TrackJS become lucr financially lucrative to the point that we can walk away um, from consulting, without a big hit, we totally will. Cool. Uh, and just a reminder, because I'm going to, oh, Paul has a follow-up question for Todd, I think. I think it's for all of you. It's, okay. Do you, so for you, and, and, and now it's smart things, but so particularly for you two, since you see what's going on with the business, users and dollars and, well, not yet dollars. We have a few dollars. Do you have an idea of, <laughs> do, when you're walking into it, do you also know when the point is that you got to get the hell out? Like, as you're walking into it, do you also already have, if we don't get to this by then, or, or if you're packing your own shoe, do, are you prepared to smack into the ground? Like, are you ready for the, the surgery part to that, <laughs> if that makes sense? We, we do have an emergency shoot. Okay. Um, and there is a point when, um, a, as a startup, there's some things that you can get for free from very large companies who want to place a bet on you that sig significantly reduce your costs. And at some point, those agreements all run out. Mm -hmm. And when those run out, our operating costs will go way up. If we don't have certain financial targets by then, that's going to be a point where we're going to pull the emergency chute and find something else to do, probably. Are you far enough along where you don't think you have to worry about it as much anymore? Oh, no, we worry all the time. <laughs> uh, if you're not worried, you're probably not moving fast enough or doing something interesting enough. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a constant sort of race against time. That's what a startup is. Um, which actually reminds me of something I heard uh, Steve Blank say. He said, if you're 
uh, a startup. Basically, the point is not to do a startup. It's to a startup is a temporary organization in search of a sustainable, scalable business model. And so, you know, startup is the start of that. But um, uh, so I think searching for that is it's all about figuring out where that like Todd is saying, where that revenue crosses that cost line and you become profitable. And uh, then you have a ton more options uh, because the clock, you're not racing against the clock, but now you're just sort of almost racing against yourself to make sure you can build something that is um, exciting enough to get people to take notice, both from a from user standpoint, investors, and potentially uh, acquirers. And as a quick follow-up to that, I think there's two lines. There's two different. There's one where your, your revenue crosses your operating costs of where I could keep doing this and it's not costing me money to provide this. But then there's a whole other line of when we could actually consider taking salary for ourselves. Mm -hmm. If we can't cross the first line, that's where it seriously becomes a question of maybe this is time to bail because I'm not going to put money into a business that makes nothing. Um, but you could, I feel like you could go a lot farther, at least we could go a lot farther in TrackJS, not taking salary, so long as the business is showing some benefit and making some mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. Just as a counterpoint, because my story is quite a bit different, um, I actually quit my job uh, at to start my previous company, um, and I basically said some some of that, quite honestly, uh, was born out of a combination of ignorance and stupidity, uh, because I didn't know any better, um, and also because I was just frustrated with my existing job, which is a really really awful. I would not recommend that anybody, you know. <laughs> Do, don't do a startup just because you hate your current job. Um, I, can, I can personally share that that is the most awful way to do a startup. Um, but on the flip side, I think everybody has to have, um, another friend of mine uh, called it the, the drain. You have sort of this floor uh, for how far you're willing to let things go um, or what you're willing to sacrifice. And that's different for everybody. In my case, I had some money in savings, and I basically told my better half, hey, I'm going to go burn this. Um, and the statistics say that I, it, I might as well just take it out back in the fire pit and burn it, because most startups don't succeed. Um, but if I do that, are you OK with it? And can we still survive? And in my case, I was not willing to uh, sacrifice my 401k. I was not willing to sacrifice my mortgage. Um, but I also had some mitigating factors that we were in a position with our house where our, our mortgage was very was relatively small. So that helped me out. But everybody's got different uh, criteria for how they figure it out. Um, and, and there isn't a single one way to do that. And I spoke a little bit about this in the last session, but um, I, I, I do a much less politically correct version of that is how long do you have before the shit hits the fan? Right? And what I mean by that is that you can't, I'm not talking about you can't go to Caribou or that you can't go here. I mean, like, the mortgage guys call in the third month. Crap hits the fan. Like, how long can you last? How, and you better know this going in. And I don't mean it in the sense of, oh, we, we have projections and revenue and all No, I mean, like, how long do you have until you're moving out by force? Or <laughs> that you can't, right? Everybody's version or of this before is Before you've burned a relationship that you really don't want to burn. <laughs> I mean, because, you know, if you're a single person, your definition, you I mean you can live on ramen forever. Well, maybe not forever. But you get the point, but if you're married and you have kids and if you've got a mortgage and two car payments, your definition of crap hitting the fan, or you can't send um, Bobby to, to, to camp or you know, piano lessons or whatever it is, we like, I just, I, I'm, I'm out of here. But everybody's crap hits the fan is going to be different, but you've got to know that going into this. Well, and to piggyback off of that, I think you, know, you need to be really honest with yourself at the beginning, yeah, right, absolutely. about that situation. But you, if you have a business partner, you have to get all your skeletons out of the closet. You have to be very honest as to, um, mm -hmm. this is my financial situation, right? This is, mm -hmm. this is my, my exit opportunity. This is all the stuff that's going on in my personal life that could negatively impact. This is where my weaknesses are. This is where my strengths are. And you have to be extremely honest about that because you are gonna work more closely when that, with your business partner or partners than anyone else you you know they're going to be family they're going to be more than family and they're going to know all the bad and all the good about you that's a really awesome segue we got a question from john whitmire um so a co-founder or partner uh is so important to the success of a startup um but 
you know, those are kind of, it's hard to find that right person. So uh, maybe Matt, uh, what are your suggestions to help someone find a partner or co-founder? Yeah, I don't know if this is good advice or bad advice, but have a fr friend that you've known for like 15 years and say, hey, do you want to come along on this ride with me? Um, did you feel like you could were... Could end up not being your friend yeah, but pretty soon. I was right? going to ask, was that something that you consciously talked about being willing to risk? Yeah, uh, no offense to Dan, but yeah, I was willing to risk it. Um, <laughs> is he, is he, uh, he, I don't think he's in here. Oh. Um, which makes that worse. Actually. I'm going to bust your... Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I think... Don't tweet that. I mean, really tweet that. A lot of you, uh, <laughs> a lot of you, know, a lot of you know Dan. Um, Probably more people know Dan than know me. So um, he's he's just as much a face of uh, Kid Blog as, as I am. And uh, you know, we've always sort of had almost like a healthy adversarial kind of friendship anyway. Sort of like continually challenging challenging each other and our ideas, whether it's you know politics or food or technology or whatever. Um, and so that actually that dynamic I think helps when you're in a startup because like Liz, like you said, you're you're in this like deep and so you just have to be basically okay with um, some of that friction and some of that tension um, and it's not so much is the friendship worth saving it's more just like um, is this someone you can see yourself going through this journey you know on and uh, uh, I, I, I consider myself quite lucky uh, that, I, that Dan was around at that time and had that sort of same mentality <coughs> of I think he was maybe more in your camp where he said his, he didn't like his day job, so he wants to do something different. Um, and so... Well, you yeah. already had a ton of users by then, though. Well, I had done the hard work, let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> do tweet that out. Yeah. Um, Dan you know, was late well, to the and party. I think, and I think that's part of that is like, okay, before he decides to like, you know, uh, connect up to this train or whatever that we're going on, he was able to see that I had invested a lot of, you know, personal finances and time, 80 hour weeks. I used to like come home from, come home from school, you know, uh, make a quick dinner. Okay, it's, uh, it's, it's four o'clock. All right, I've got eight more hours uh, in the day. And um, so he, he was able to see that I had invested that much in. And so um, I, I guess he trusted that I was in it, you know, for the right reasons. Too. I think part of it too is you've got to like, no, trust the person. But if you've got spouses, introduce them to each other. If you've got kids, introduce them to each other. Because it's no joke. I mean, I see how much time you and Dan spend together. And I don't, I don't know that I could like somebody after spending that much time. <laughs> I mean, but yeah. they get along really well. I mean, they have this really cool dynamic. But man, I'm saying uh, anything that's going to be those outside influences, you want to get all the garbage out. Mm -hmm. And I always suggest to folks, and pick out your, you know, with your co with your co-founder or partners. This is when I can't go on any further. It's a much easier conversation to have up front than two weeks before it's going to happen. Like, have the divorce plan first before you get into the relationship. I, I always say there are startup prenuptial agreements. Yes. Yeah, I, I always say that there's no rules for how to, you know, whether you're joining a startup as an early employee or whether you're founding one with a co-founder or whatever, there are no rules on the right way to do it. There is one rule that is the wrong way, and that is not telling somebody, not being open, because it's surprises that kill relationships. Um, so that that's probably the one thing I've said a lot. Um, we're have getting- we, Have we scared y'all away from this yet? So. <laughs> We're getting some really awesome questions on uh, it's uh, it's it's minibar.voicehive.com uh, and uh, pack shoot I think is the button to click there. Uh, but this one sounds like a great one for Paul. Uh, in your travels, what are you thinking of people seeing as the the issues that feel the most risky to people? You know, is it are they afraid of losing their job or of failing or what? You know. Yes. What do you uh. what do you see people really getting? Con consternated over when they're thinking about this I might flip the stuff. question a little bit if I can. I think it's that I, because you're all in this room, so I'm not talking to you, but it's the folks who aren't in this room who aren't thinking about all the things that they should be thinking about. What I mean is, 
Uh, there's a few guys I had a conversation with last week. They work at a really large bank in town, um, two JavaScript developers, a back-end PHP person. They have this romantic idea. That they're going to go, and the three of them are going to go work with startups and be like a pod little consulting contracting group and go work with a bunch of startups in town. And it's going to be glorious, and they're going to make a bunch of money because a bunch of startups are going to cash out, and they're going to have a little bit of equity in each one of them. Yeah. So. <laughs> They're all married, they all have kids, they all have a mortgage, they all have two car payments. Um, they haven't thought this out, you know? And, and, and I think it's, I, 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 we spoke for about 45 minutes at the end of the conversation, I said, look, I don't want to be a jerk, but you guys aren't ready for this. Like, you have not thought about the what ifs and the then that's, and then what happens when the, when the startup doesn't pay and you're now 120 days out? And what happens when, and then you, if you have to start doing consulting, or I said, well, what happens if one of you actually has to go I hate to say this. What happens if one of you has to go work at Target to sell your soul in the short run to be able to fund home? No offense to Target. Um, I just didn't say Best Buy because we're here. Um, <laughs> Substitute big company yeah, here. Um, I think it's that we're, they, I don't think we, I, I'm not trying to scare anybody away from it, but worry about the, the really bad stuff first. What ha okay, you don't want to lose the house. You don't want to lose your marriage or relationship. Um, I think people worry about stupid stuff, like, probably not you guys, but like, how much am I going to work, and, and am I really not going to be able to have the summer vacation, am I really not going to be able to go fishing as much? I really want you to think about the, that holy crap stuff. So it's not exactly the, I just spun the question a little bit, but I, we always worry about just the here and now and the fluffy stuff, most people. Well, and what I think is great about getting that out right away, then you don't need to worry about it because you've already sort of thought through your plans. Because if, if you don't think about it and you don't address it, it's always going to be burning in the back of your mind, like, oh, oh. And so by talking about it up front and, and sharing that with your partners and your team, then you already know. And then you can be like, well, if this doesn't work out, I, I've got these options. And it, it actually, because being in a startup is stressful enough, the day-to-day -day changes, even the hour-to-hour -hour can sometimes change. And it is like being on a roller coaster. Um, just knowing that you've got some plans in place is just, it, it can be helpful. It, don't just share it up front. Share it all the time. Because everybody's opinions change. Like over the course of, of TrackJS, People's opinions of what we should do and what, what TrackJS was going to be has shifted. And it's been great that we've had those conversations of sometimes people think we're going to you know, sell to Google for a billion dollars. Then other people, we just want to run it as a lifestyle business forever. And sometimes you know, we might be getting a little bit of interest in ventures. And like, oh, we should go and get vested. Oh, maybe we shouldn't. And it, it's maybe we're just manic and we're just all over the place, but it's good to constantly have those conversations because people's opinions of what we should do, should we bootstrap, should we not bootstrap, should we sell, should we run it forever, change month to month. So how do you cast those conversations in a way that, you know, so, so I remember the first time that I kind of wanted to have a conversation like that and I was like, well, what if kind of like it's perceived that my goals are different than yours and and that could cause tension, right? So how do you guys have that conversation in a way that is constructive? We go to the Happy Gnome, and we have a few beers. And, uh, and then we talk about, we ask that question, so where is everybody at? Are we, are we going to sell this? Are we going to run it? Are we going to you know, make a pitch deck and run for investors? And we, we just have that conversation. So there's th three of you guys yes. involved? And so, so what's, what's kind of your out clause? I mean, what, you know, what, have you talked about what's going to happen when one of you says this isn't right anymore for me? Have you have you had that conversation about how that's going to that would work, or is that something you'll just deal with when you get there? And well, no. Now you're making me all nervous. Like we should have had that conversation. <laughs> well, I don't know. But I mean, it, it kind of sounded. Like, I, I kind of made the assumption you'd had that, but maybe the, the, you haven't. The answer to that, I think, so really. The, forehead. <laughs> the answer to that, I think, really depends on on where the company is at when somebody wants out. Like if we're not operationally profitable and somebody wants out, it'll be like, all right, see ya. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> you don't you don't have to do work anymore. If we're making money, if we're especially if we're making significant money, I think that's a different conversation of then do we have to buy out equity? How much is it worth? That's a really complicated conversation to have that it didn't feel like it 
made sense to me to have that conversation in hypotheticals at this point. So we haven't had it. Okay, Paul. I want to ask Dan a question. Okay. He's not here. I mean, Matt, sorry. <laughs> Somebody go find Dan. So when you get up in the morning, so we, I, I, I think I have a bit of this, I think there's a negative fog sitting over this at the moment. But when you get up in the morning, like how jacked up are you? Like how freaking like awesome is this? And Eden Prairie, probably a great, great place to teach, awesome school district. Mm -hmm. But you don't have that crappy day job anymore mm -hmm. in that sense. Like how cool is it to be working on KidBlog? I mean, you've been at this for a long time, but how cool is it to get to the part where you're going to have almost 5 million users? And like, what's that like? It's pretty good to be me. Um... <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, that was awesome. Well, no, I that mean, was a softball pitch. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, so I actually had the, I guess, again, poor me, but I loved my teaching job, and I think people suggested I was good at it. And I love doing this. Um, uh, running a startup is essentially perfectly aligned with my personality in general. I'm always doing some project or tinkering on something or trying to learn something new. Um, I have box, like for example, I have boxes of like Arduino components and stuff that I'm soon going to start wiring up and doing some kind of mad scientist stuff. My buddy Todd here is going to help me. Um, and <laughs> and so like that is just my my attitude toward sort of life in general is continually be tinkering and hacking and building. Um, and so in that sense, um, and actually teaching was awesome in that regard too because you did kind of have a lot of autonomy within the classroom. Um, it is very corporate when you start thinking about the district hierarchy and stuff like that. But um, it, is, it is awesome to be able to wake up and say basically I am, in, in many ways, I am in charge of my own success or failure. Um, the, the stressful part is uh, everybody that's hitched their, you know, cart to you is also sort of, you're, you're very cognizant of the fact that they are depending on you kind of doing some of this <laughs> right. Um, and that's where some of those risks go beyond. Like, I don't care if I fail per se, but you want to make sure that you take care of the people around you. Mm -hmm. And that, and actually, if I can just say one quick thing about that word failure, I think it's cool, you know, when we read like, biographies of people from Silicon Valley and it's just like, oh, failure is considered this badge of honor, right? And, and uh, it's just like one uh, door closing and two more open or whatever. Um, around here, I just, I think that's BS. I think people <laughs> think of failures as failures. And um, so there is a, and maybe it's, Paul, you alluded to in your previous talk, this kind of passive aggressive, overly modest, judgmental Minnesota thing or whatever, but um, that, that risk of failure is, is perceived, and it's not anybody's fault, and nobody's doing it the wrong way here, per se, but it really is perceived as a, as a knock, um, or as something to kind of be like, oh, yeah, nice, nice, nice try there with your startup. That was, that was kind of pathetic. That was cute. Uh, yeah, and, and, so, and I think part of that is because there's a really fine line between like visionary and ambitious and delusional. And uh, <laughs> you, you have to be a little bit delusional about what you're working on so that there's a perception from some people that, yeah, they're a little bit crazy. Um, and that is just having, you know, talk about the personal side of being a star. You have to be okay admitting that you're a little crazy to be doing this stuff. Um, That's a really good segue because I actually wanted to send this over to Liz to talk about be, be, because I mean that that honestly that was that was really so so We're on failure. <laughs> and I, I really I really actually kind of uh, I've I've actually the only thing that kind of made me nervous about this whole talk was how I was going to actually ask Liz this question because failure is this awful thing right? Um, but I wanted you on the panel because you've been there and came out the other side. So tell us about what that was like and how you managed your co-founder and your team and, and then what did you do next? Right. Um, so smile, look at the camera quick. Quick. We gotta get our photo. All right, photo up. <laughs> um, so you know for me, I'm not I'm not the type of person that gets upset about failure, but it's the anticipation that brings you up to that failure point that that can be taxing on me. Um, and so, um, you know, I had a great relationship and still have a relationship with my, um, my partner the, since I was a co-founder. And, uh, you know, I knew about three months before I decided that this wasn't working, that, you know, that things were, things were a little off. 
Um, and we had some very candid, candid conversations um, about uh, you know, the possibility of exiting. And there, you know, there weren't any surprises when that day came to make that decision. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do next. Um, you know, thankfully, I still had my day job, right? And so what I did was I took a few months and sort of regrouped and said, what am I going to do? So I had no plan. So the first, like, it was like the first time in my life where, you know, I, I went on this, our culture sort of fosters in you, you know, this is what you do. You, you, you go to school, then you go to college, then you get a job, then you get in, you know, you get in a relationship and you get engaged and you get married and you have a kid. Um, and I was going through this period in my life where I was divorced. You know, I decided I didn't want to go on this career path of moving up in corporate America. Um, and so this life plan of mine sort of changed. And it was the first time in my life I didn't know what I was going to do. And it turns out that's actually pretty cool to like take the time to say, you know what? I'm just going to figure out what it's like to be me. And so I took a few months and I decided I love technology. I love working with new cool things. And so I decided that I was going to make an aggressive move and to start doing mobile application development. And that's what I've been doing for the last three, three years. Um, and eventually wanting to land back in a startup, which I am now. So how was, how was when, when you started interviewing for that first job after CN, Yep. how was, how was, how did you yeah, how do, you, your how, background? Do you how do you describe, OK, I'm looking for a new job because my startup tanked? Thanks, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> he took the words out of my mouth. Um, well, so. Sorry for the bluntness. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> uh, you know, what I did, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been working in interactive for 15 years. So I had, I had mm. my other job experience to rely on. But I utilize everything that I learned through having a startup. So having a startup, if, you've, if you're able to maintain it for more than a year, it's like getting a crash course in an MBA. You learn a lot of things about um, creating new process organically, developing teams, talking about budgets and five-year plans, pitching to investors, um, just being able to talk about an idea in a very, um, very different way than if, if, if you've never worked in a startup before or never taken, you know, applied for your MBA before. Um, and so how I utilized that to my advantage um, when applying for a job is I sought out companies that were working with startups. Um, and I knew that I'd be in a good position to help um, translate their business needs to the product that we needed to deliver for them. And so that's how I, I use that to my advantage. And I think also having a startup, if you talk to a lot of investors, um, you're actually really good about talking about yourself. So that helps a lot with the interview process. Mm -hmm. So switching gears a little bit, real quick question that I think would be kind of interesting to know. Um, what are your business backgrounds? Formal education, MBA, school of hard knocks, et cetera. Let's just go down the row here, start with Todd. Uh, I had a corporate job that I was starting to climb the rungs of management. Um, I went and got a sort of MBA degree. Uh, it's called a management of technology degree. It's kind of like an MBA for engineers. Um, that enabled me to start a consultancy business, which platformed for starting TrackJS. Because uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I am a startup of my own, right? Um, I graduated from the U of M in 95, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, got a job at Enterprise Rent-A-Car, because that's what all college grads do when they don't know what they're going to do with the rest of their life. Um, did crappy sales jobs for three years. Um, Answer an ad in the newspaper, um, November, no, October 27th, because I actually remember, October 27th of 1997 for it said, Headhunter, 100K. Okay, so I went in and I interviewed. <laughs> I worked for a really um, crappy, no longer in business, unethical piece of crap search firm um, for four months, figured I learned how to do it wrong. I was in debt and decided to go work for myself, which also, frankly, is not a good idea. <laughs> And 16 years later, I'm on version 4.0 of me because it's changed over the years, and I've got my ass kicked in two recessions. Sorry, it's true. Um, and I, I'm ruined. I, I could not go work for somebody else. Like I can go work with somebody else. 
um, which is also, I think, part of the thing, too, is could you ever see yourself go work for someone again? And I think that most of us say no. We could go work with somebody, but not for. I could fake it for a little while. <laughs> Um, me. Uh, so I uh, went to school to become an architect and decided that wasn't right for me because I can't draw. Uh, and so, uh, <laughs> but I had, uh, I had already developed my first website when I was 16 using Notepad, of course, right? As all uh, hardcore developers do. Um, and so I was... Here for Notepad. <laughs> uh, uh, I was uh, sort of handed a job opportunity to become uh, a web developer uh, back in early 2000 uh, at, a, at a large corporation, Thomson Reuters, uh, and uh, was like, yeah, I can totally do it. And I loved it, and I stayed there for, for multiple years until I decided down this, this startup path. Cool. Matt? So like I said at the beginning, I have a BA in computer science, and then I got my master's in education. Um, and my business sense comes from my co-founder, Dan, who was an IT auditor for some large accounting firms. And so he is my CFO. Uh, and so I delegate a lot of that to him. Uh, for my part, I uh, was just a, a BA in computer science related field and uh, worked for a lot of enterprises and yeah, school of hard knocks myself. But I think the other thing too, uh, if if, if I could do this over again, and in fact, it's kind of the way it turned out with Approve my second time around was, was if you are a first time person uh, who hasn't done a startup before, either coming on as an early employee with experienced founders or finding a co-founder with more experience than you is a really awesome thing to do. So Michael's done a couple of startup things before um, with some success. He was involved with LimeWire, if you're familiar with that. Um, but um, it's, it's really awesome having somebody uh, who has a little bit of experience in that. I'm wondering, how many of you are in a startup now and you were hoping to get some sort of wisdom from us today? Raise your hand. Okay, if wow. you're thinking about doing it, you came here because you're thinking about either doing or working with a startup but haven't yet done it, raise your hand. That's how many awesome. of you? How many of you did we just scare away from this whole idea? <laughs> There's like four hands, just so you know. There are like me. So one thing that I, that in terms of like, should I do the whole startup thing, um, we've only got... <laughs> Uh, we're actually getting pretty much right at the end of time, but one of the things that I hear a lot is, you know, what is it that's making you happy in the world? Um, and for me, I was able to check the box for really good pay. Um, I was occasionally able to check the box for kind of interesting project. I was, you know, struggling to check the box of doing something I was personally passionate about. But I, I had all of these boxes checked, except somehow I was never really able to, to figure out the whole happiness thing. And then all of a sudden when I did the startup, it completely flipped the other direction. And the only box that I had to figure out was how to make money. Mm -hmm. Which, not to trivialize that, because I still haven't figured it out in five years. Uh, but it's one thing that I know I will figure out or can figure out, and it's a lot easier to focus on than uh, how do I take this large company that I'm working for and turn it into something I'm passionate about, which is almost not possible, right? So, um, I, so yeah. So one, one final thing, because I think we are out of time, right? This is supposed to end yep. it. Um, yep. So this is an unconference, which is the awesome thing about Minibar. So we're all just hanging out. So if you guys have like more questions and oh, want to keep gosh, talking yes. about this, absolutely, we'll hang out here or go off into the cafeteria and keep chatting. Yeah, let me. Uh, do we is lunch after this or is it? Um, one, more one more after this. So we're we're going to get kicked out of here in a couple of minutes, and I want to be respectful to the next person because the previous presenter was was good with us. But seriously. Um, is I, I think we talked about this all across the board here, but certainly I, and I know, uh, yeah, I think everybody here, feel free to reach out to us if you like personally. I really love talking to people about this sort of stuff, um, and I know these guys too. Uh, so feel free to reach out if you've got questions that you don't feel good or that we didn't get to ask here, um, and I'm sure we'd be happy to, to chat online or offline. And thank you, Neil, for putting it together. Thanks to the panel.